Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin, I wanted to give a few housekeeping tips. Um, first is we're going to have translations. So there's a button at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you, you will hear the translation. And uh, para los que hablan español, tenemos traducción y hay un botón uh, abajo. Y si lo imprimen, pueden escuchar todo en español. Uh, the other thing is, um, and we since we have translation, he will repeat that for me in Spanish. Um, if you're calling from outside of the city um, or a neighborhood in the city or another city, we'd love you to just put that in the chat so we know where everybody's chiming in from. And another thing about the chat space is if you want to post some questions, we'll try to get to that in the final portion of the session. So please use your chat space to post those questions. Um, so again, hi everyone, my name is Marta Segura and I'm the City of LA's first mobilization, sorry, Climate Emergency Mobilization Director. This is actually my like eighth week. And as a director, uh, we wanna advocate for environmental justice um, and I've been advocating for environmental justice most of my life. Thank you all for joining us um, for this first Climate Equity and Health Roundtable. We're really thrilled to have you all join us, especially our lineup of speakers is so amazing. So in LA, I wanted to share with you, we're focused on addressing the crisis through social equity lens to address the root causes and create green just transformation with LA's Green New Deal as our guidepost. On this 51st anniversary of Earth Day, we'll explore how we're connecting and conveying climate equity and health together. To solve this issue with bold systemic changes driven by participatory governance and creative civic engagement. Also, this event would not be complete for LA without our mayor, Eric Garcetti, dropping a few words of wisdom about his bold and equitable policy for all Angelinos. So next, um, you will see a few words from our mayor, Eric Garcetti. Hello and very happy Earth Day. I'm Mayor Garcetti, and there's no question we are facing a climate emergency, something we can feel and see in the record-breaking temperatures, the devastating wildfires of the last few years. And here in Los Angeles, we are confronting this crisis together with a bold approach that's rooted in equity and in justice. Through our city's Green New Deal, we are charting a path to protect our planet and natural resources to deliver environmental justice and to make our economy work better for everyone. We're doing that by setting big goals and laying out specific steps to meet them, reaching 80% renewable energy in LA by 2030, six years ahead of previous commitments, and getting to zero emissions at the Port of Los Angeles, the busiest container port in the Western Hemisphere, by adopting zero emission trucks and on-road equipment and forging international partnerships to help us reduce emissions throughout the supply chain around the world. We're also making it easier for Angelinos every day to tap into clean energy and clean transportation options. Now LA is home to the largest public electric vehicle charging network anywhere in America. We've launched the Low Income Community Solar Program, and we've expanded our clean energy rebates to make sure nobody is left behind in this work. We've installed over 60 lane miles of new bike lanes this past year alone and kicked off our Slow Streets program. And we're providing Angelinos with access to safe green modes of getting around. And to better understand community level air quality and tailor our programs to where the need is greatest, we have dramatically increased our locally driven air quality monitoring. In Los Angeles, we are building solutions. And I wanna thank Marta Segura, the director of our city's first ever Climate Emergency Mobilization Office for her vision and for organizing this incredible event. Thank you, Marta, for your office and the work you're doing, creating a groundbreaking model for civic engagement around the climate crisis that's working to create equitable policies to improve the lives of all Angelinos. Let me also acknowledge the Bureau of Public Works Vice President Aura Garcia and LADWP Board President Cynthia McLean Hill and our Department of Human Rights Executive Director Capri Maddox for all of your extraordinary leadership on environmental justice issues. Friends, there is still so much work to be done and it's not for the faint of heart, but together in my heart, I know we can tackle the climate emergency and we can also accelerate equitable solutions that benefit our hardest hit communities. I can't wait to continue that work together today, tomorrow and the years ahead. 
Thank you and enjoy the Great. Those are some very inspiring words from Mayor Garcetti. So I want to thank him for boldly leading the way while grounding solutions with a social justice lens. Also, as chair of C40, Mayor Garcetti is delivering a vision for green and just transformation for cities across the globe. And now there are over 700 mayors on board to create that green and just transformation and push for bolder change globally. Now let's dive into, well, wait one second. I want to acknowledge where we're chiming in from, from Boston to Boyle Heights, South LA and uh, Los Feliz, Echo Park, Silver Lake. Uh, what else here? Palos Verdes, I see you, East Hollywood, Baldwin Hills, Sherman Oaks, Midwest, Mid City West, Rialto Hills, West LA Palms, Valley Village. So we've got so much of the city covered tonight. Uh, and somebody said that uh, this is Tonga and Chumash land. And I did want to acknowledge that. So thank you so much for reminding me that we, we are all on unceded sacred land of the Tonga and the Chumash. Franklin Hills, um, Alley Sanitation and Environment is uh, represented. Streets LA is represented. Um, so again, from Boyle Heights to Boston, we are here for you. And next, we're going to dive into the introductions with our really stellar, stellar uh, lineup of speakers. First, we have Capri Maddox, the Executive Director of LA Civil Human Rights and Equity Department. Uh, we also, ha um, she has intellect and powerful sense of justice and equality, and it's all perfectly suited to defend all Angelinos from discrimination, bias, and by defending their equal treatment in private employment, housing, education, or commerce by initiating and investigating complaints of discrimination um, empowered by the LA Civil and Human Rights Ordinance. So that's Capri. And then next we have Cynthia McLean Hill, uh, our LADWP president. She is a bold and inspiring advocate for equitable climate and energy policy centered in racial and environmental equity with a phenomenal record of service in the public and nonprofit sector. She is also a managing director for a law firm in their regulatory land use and environmental law practice and brings an equity, equity lens to that as well um, and to her role as president of LADWP, which is the largest utility, public utility in the nation. And next we have Aura Garcia, the Vice President of Public Works. Aura has dedicated her career to advocating for the advancement of the most vulnerable in her community, including at-risk youth and at-risk students and small business owners everywhere. Aura has more than 20 years of experience in building community revitalization and projects to improve quality of life for residents throughout LA. And now is focused on green workforce development, especially for our youth. And Aura is also the daughter of Guatemalan immigrants. So you are each powerful um, leaders in your own spaces and I'm so grateful to have you here. And we really are, you know, so honored to have you launch our first event for the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office. And before we get started though, to engage the audience a little more, let's put up our first poll to get a sense of where our viewers are on climate, what their perception is of climate issues and the climate crisis. So viewers, when you hear the words climate crisis, what comes to mind? What comes to mind first? Health disparities from fossil fuel emissions, um, disasters like hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, and melting Arctic ice, or green jobs and decarbonization, or disproportionate impacts on vulnerable communities, and finally, biodiversity, open space, parks, and trees. So please pick one of these, and we will show them on the screen, and and we'll have a discussion about it. Ah, 50% of the people have voted. So if you could just click on one of the buttons, that would be super helpful. Great, we're at 75%. We're just gonna wait two more seconds and then we'll be there. We're gonna share the poll in a second. There we go. So interestingly enough, 12% um, related to health disparities first, 49% to disasters and uh, droughts and hurricanes and melting Arctic ice, only 7% um, related to green jobs and decarbonization, and disproportionate impacts on vulnerable communities, 32%. So, yes. Um, oh, 
biodiversity, open space, and parks and trees. We didn't really have any anybody respond to that one. So that's a very interesting response. I expected a lot more for biodiversity, but I'm happy to see that people uh, really responded, but disproportionate impacts on vulnerable communities rated pretty high up there. It's always interesting to me to see what people's perception is of the climate crisis and, and the climate um, issues as a whole. So Cynthia, let's go to you first. In your experience, um, how do you prioritize these issues? Which of these issues do you work on and, and hope to prioritize? Um, well, obviously, uh, given and good to see you and everybody else, and I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, a great uh, first um, effort on your part, so thank you for hosting this. Um, and I know that it'll be aired uh, tomorrow on Earth Day, so happy Earth Day or happy early Earth Day to everyone. Um, given where I sit at LADWP, obviously, when I think about climate change, I think about it through the lens of um, of how we decarbonize, and in particular, how we decarbonize our grid. Um, but it goes way beyond that. And I think our survey really kind of hits to, you know, how you view it depends off, uh, an awful lot on where you sit. So if you're in an EJ community, what you're thinking about are the impacts of climate change and the impacts of climate change Everyone feels them, but like every other malady in our society, the impacts in EJ communities are also often far more extreme. And so you have the health impacts and you have impacts related to air quality and to heat. Um, you have access issues. Uh, one of the things that has come up quite a lot as we have um, gone around the city previewing the LA 100, our groundbreaking study that looks at how and how quickly um, our department can transition to 100% renewable energy. One of the things that comes up in EJ communities is great, but what's it gonna cost? So cost is a serious issue as it relates to climate change, not just the fact that we have to avoid it and do everything that we can to reverse the impacts of climate change, but how is that effort going to, it going to impact and affect me? So when I look at it, I look at it very holistically. A, from the department's perspective, what can we do to decarbonize our grid and to support electrification as the path toward further and broader decarbonization? So electrification in sectors well beyond the energy sector. But then secondly, what impacts will that have on communities? How do we make sure that the benefit of those efforts are distributed equally? And how do we make sure that as we're doing our work, benefits around job creation, benefits around access to um, the infrastructure necessary to thrive in um, an electrified world, that those things are also equally distrib distributed. Thank you, Cynthia, so much. Those are um, some very comprehensive and holistic um, ways to look at climate crisis. And I know that the LADWP's LA100 is going to be a phenomenal step forward. And I wanna just share right now that we need all the community engagement that we can um, on LADWP, LADWP's LA100 to shape the policy that we need to get to 100% decarbonization. So next I wanna to go to Capri. And I know Capri Maddox, the executive director of the LA Civil Human Rights and Equity Department has a lot on her mind today as all of us do, because we have a lot going on around the nation and I want, get, I want to give Capri as, as the lead person for the city of Los Angeles that deals with issues of civil rights, not just the opportunity to connect environmental justice and civil rights to this panel, but to talk about today and how she's feeling. Thank you for that, uh, Marta. We um, know that um, you know, today is, is a big day and I really appreciate you for you know, hosting this important conversation. But before we talk about the environment, I think we need to just take a moment um, in light of the fact that the Chauvin verdict has come in to just talk about the environment here in Los Angeles. Today is a big day for our, our country. It's a, but it's a complex day for me and my community. Uh, we know that uh, justice was served for George Floyd um, and you know, there was accountability for his murder and the world knows that there will be accountability for the killing of an unarmed black man. But um, let me be clear, this 
uh, does not start and end with one trial. We still have 400 years of pain and oppression that we've been dealing with. And the reality is it took a young woman filming the um, incident uh, that resulted in, in George Floyd's murder and EMT telling the officer that he was actually going to kill George Floyd, people calling 911 on the police at the scene, uh, protests from around the world, outrage from police leaders across the nation, including here in Los Angeles, and an attorney general, you know, with the guts to actually bring um, this case. So, and, and then it still took the eyes of the whole world watching to get justice um, for George Floyd. So we know that we, uh, you know, have some measure of justice today, but we still live in a country where a heavenly arm white male can kill other people in a mass casualty event and be able to safely surrender to police, whereas an African-American man accused of minor infractions like driving with tinted windows and air freshener or a broken taillight, this, is, this can be a death, death sentence to folks. And so um, the verdict is a turning point in America, but we have a long road ahead. Um, and it's not just in policing and housing, employment, income, and of course, yes, the environment. So um, I just wanted to, to say how fortunate I am to be here alongside you and other leaders that stand for justice as we continue the work for um, people of color and all underserved communities um, here in Los Angeles and around the world. Um, and I think I should probably answer your question as well. Um, as it relates to climate issues, is that okay for me to do that at this time? Sure, I just want to say one thing before you do. I, I wanted to point out that it's ironic and also very tragic that what led to George Floyd's death was partially the fact that the officer would not let him breathe. And he was not the first man, first black man, or that was whose air and his uh, lack of ability to breathe because they were putting pressure on their you know, their lungs, and that's why that was the cause of death. And I want to relate that back to health disparities and asthma in our community because, you know, I, part of the defense was, oh, it was a pre-existing condition, and that was why he passed away. Yes, actually, there are a lot of pre-existing uh, conditions, uh, including asthma and COPD in our communities. So I want to say that that is an environmental injustice. And, and if it is known that we have pre-existing conditions in our communities, then they need to be even that much more cognizant that ex excessive force can cause that much more easily in our communities. So I just kind of wanted to connect the air we breathe and, and the I can't breathe slogan uh, to environmental justice and what you're saying, Capri. So go ahead. Thank you so much, Marta. And you know, just thank you for, you know, making that connection and also just launching the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office. Um, and I just to recognize Air, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who has definitely made Los Angeles a national leader in, um, in, the, in the climate change um, response. Um, you know, I think it's important to also just thank our city council, especially Council President Nori Martinez, Council Members Coretz and Bloomingfield to that have really been at the forefront of justice um, as it relates to climate um, justice and of course supporting this new office. And you know, as from your question, I was looking at the poll and I see that many people may not think equity when they hear climate change, but equity is a central part of how we respond to climate change. Um, we have inequities in many places and systemic racism um, but they've also created a variety of health outcomes for different communities, as you mentioned. 9% um, of residents in South LA live in close proximity to truck routes. And 12, 21% uh, of residents in, in Southeast Los Angeles live adjacent to um, pollution power plants. And so uh, polluting power plants. And I think it's um, important to know that your zip code should not determine whether or not you have asthma. Um, we can, we know that in South Los Angeles and East Los Angeles, especially Southeast Los Angeles, there the, that we have the highest rates of hospitalization and emergency department visits due to asthma for both children and adults. Um, and 16% of African-American children 
in LA have asthma compared to 7% of their white counterparts here in the city we we love. Right. Um, and I, I've been one of those, those, those folks. And quite frankly, as a child with asthma, there's had to go to the emergency rooms um, pretty much almost until I was through law school. I remember in law school is probably the last time I was sought yeah. medical care. But I'm just mm-hmm. saying that this is an issue that we all deal with. And of course, um, over the last 13 months, my asthma con- condition has been of concern um, for me as we dealt with the, the COVID crisis. crisis. So mm-hmm. the inequities are real. And um, when we fight climate response, um, the, the climate response needs to get to the root of the issue, and which are the inequities. Thank you so much, Capri. That's that's so impactful and so uh, thought-provoking. It's left me with a lot to think about on how we deal with these issues collaboratively and, and how important our experiences are when we um, bring our leadership into focus and how we represent our constituencies. Our experiences are so relevant. So now, Auda, we want to hear from you and what... What comes to mind? What is a priority for you when you think of climate? Uh, Thank you, Marta, and thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here among such um, great women. So thank you to all and Marta for putting today's event together. It's it's really nice to be here. Um, I think one of the things that by seeing the poll just now, it made me think that there's a big spectrum and there's a more education we need to do. We need to educate our folks in our communities and in all communities, what it is climate crisis. What do we we refer as climate crisis and what they should be focusing on to fix or help us get to a a place where we can Um. fix our climate climate crisis. Uh, So I would say that education is a big one. It's a big one for us. It's a big one to make sure that their community is involved in what we're doing as we work towards more sustainable efforts. So through the lens of the Board of Public Works, we really work on city services and providing what, you know, what folks need, everyday folks, right, from all parts of the city. And so I just want, part of what I want, I want focus and I focus and I pay attention to is, are we educating everyone? Is everybody going to have the same level of playing field? Is it going to be the same platform for everyone? And so those are the lenses that I'm always looking through this climate crisis conversation as we have these conversations. And I know that our council president, Noreen Martinez, will will hear from her in a bit, but I do have to say and be honest that the first time I heard environmental injustice or environmental justice, in other words, was through through Nuri Martinez, to Councilwoman Martinez, many many years ago, she ha- she was in this fight, and I, and she continues to be in this fight. And I remember even thinking back then, working in Bacoima, uh, thinking, wow, you know, she's really paying attention to something that a lot of us in the community are not. And so she really pinpointed asthma, the lead, the in in our walls, in our paint. Uh, we, you know, even back then, this was probably. Uh, my daughter is 18 now, so she was probably like two years old when I was working back in the, in the community with promotoras. And I remember we would speak a lot about the injustice in that area, about the pollution that we were breathing every day and how our kids were still expected to, to thrive in, in, our, in our school system and be measured along others, but they were not starting at the same time or at the same place. And so a lot had to do with the with the pollution and the environment that they were living in. And so I, I just have to, I wanted to say that because uh, Noreen Martinez was one of the first women fighters in this environmental justice, injustice that we have. Great. That's an awesome segue, Aura. And thank you for those remarks because it does make the issue of environmental justice and health disparities much more relevant. And I hope that uh, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office in collaboration with everyone here can make that a reality um, sooner rather than later. So now with that great uh, segue out of for Council President Noreen Martinez, uh, I'd like to introduce her and her powerful messaging that echoes the discussion that we're having today. And so whenever our producer is ready, please put that great uh, message on screen. So it's 
crisp speak with you today as we celebrate Earth Week. I always say that I became an environmentalist not out of choice, but because I had to. I grew up in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, a place that for generations has been a dumping ground for things like power plants, factories, landfills, and freeways. A place that contains land uses that would be unacceptable in more affluent communities. When you grow up around this, environmentalism is not an abstract idea. It is something you literally smell, see every single day. You see diesel trucks and smokestacks. You can smell the fumes coming from nearby factories. You witness the effects that these facilities have on your friends, your neighbors, and your families. In the Northeast San Fernando Valley, children carry around inhalers because of their asthma. And older residents suffer from heart attacks and other illnesses caused by or exacerbated by pollution. When you grow up in a place like the Northeast San Fernando Valley, you have to be an environmentalist because more often than not, your life depends on it. This is why I authored the motion to create a Green New Deal for Los Angeles. This is an important time because at the city, state, and federal level, we are seeing unprecedented investment in infrastructure. And if these resources are coordinated, we can totally transform communities. We can build streets that are safe for kids to walk and bike to school, that has shade for an elderly person waiting for the bus, and that reduces local flooding by capturing and cleaning stormwater. However, we can't just expect this to happen because we have seen for decades that low-income communities of color are often last in line for these types of investments. Projects go to more affluent communities with the loudest voices. To make the Green New Deal a reality for all Angelinos, we have to advocate and organize. We have to make sure that frontline communities that currently suffer disproportionately from pollution and environmental injustice are first in line. With the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, we are on our way to achieving this goal. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to make this dream a reality. Thank you, Council President Nuri Martinez for those powerful words and such a impressionable and very, very, very visible um, video that uh, conveys to me that many of us became accidental environmentalists or environmental justice advocates, not by choice, but by experience and by exposure. So, um, I'm also very grateful to Council President Nuri Martinez for Ali's Green New Deal. And as I mentioned earlier, that's our guidepost at the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office so that we can achieve um, equity, justice, and, and all of the climate solutions goals that we need to achieve that. And I want to say before I go on to next poll is that including communities um, that are most vulnerable, including communities of color, is not because we're trying to be, just because we're trying to be equitable. It's, if we don't include all communities, we will not have a climate solution. We will not get to the results that we want of decarbonizing and reaching zero emissions because everybody has to be on board. But the investments need to be there and the policies need to be there to make that a reality. And I guess what I'm feeling is very, very well accompanied by some powerful leaders at the city to make that happen. So thank you all for those amazing words and for being such powerful leaders in your own spaces and making the you know, thoughts connect because that's exactly what we need. So now on to our next poll. Uh, audience, which of these is your top priority? Equitable, renewable energy systems and green jobs, connecting civil rights to environmental justice and climate justice, preparing, clim preparing for climate disasters like droughts and wildfires, or wildfire, wildlife corridors, open space protection and expansion. So we'll take about 30 seconds. Yep, all right, you guys are jumping on quickly. Thank you so much for voting. Great, we're about 60% now, a couple more seconds. We'd like to get to 75%. Okay. Great. We're ending the poll, it's coming right up. All right. So again, what steps uh, need to be our next priority? Um, after our discussion, equitable renewable energy systems and green jobs for all got 43%. Connecting civil rights to environmental justice and climate justice, 29%, almost 30. Preparing for climate disasters like droughts and wildfires, 24%. 
and wildlife corridors, open space protection and expansion got 4%. Great. Um, and again, I think what this tells me is that we need to do a better job to advise people what, how interconnected all of these climate issues are. And fortunately, that's what we're doing today and we will continue to do. Um, so again, Cynthia, having seen this last poll and after that last great discussion on um, our own personal priorities, how, how, how do you feel about this last poll? Well, I'll tell you, um, first, uh, Council President Martinez is one of my personal heroes. She's been amazing in terms of her leadership on these issues. Um, and from my perspective, what's most critical, um, even above and beyond educating community, is elevating community voices. Um, it's really shifting the lens through which we make decisions and how we evaluate what it is we should be doing. We talk about sometimes what happens in government, what happens in policymaking writ large is we start to talk about things in very narrow silos without recognizing. And I think that that's what the way in which you pull this panel together and what you've heard from everyone speaking is that these are all the same issues. They are connected in ways that they, I mean, when you talk about intersectionality, this is an area where that where that is um, resonant. And so you can't, at least at the department, when we talk to community groups about um, LA 100 and about decarbonization, inevitably, they talk to, they, they, they're on board with that, but they also talk to us about jobs. They talk to us about health. They talk to us about, um, about access. They talk to us about cost. And as a part of the study that was conducted by um, InRail, uh, we looked at, health impacts. We looked at jobs and, and the impact on the economy of this transition that we'll be making. And to the extent that we begin to, all of us, think about not just what we're doing, but where we're doing it and, and the, the, the real and critical need to connect to communities that will tell us what their issues are. And we've just got to listen. That becomes a huge part of, of what, of the shift that I think has been made, certainly in LA and its leadership, a shift to hearing from those people who are affected, letting them speak to us in their language about their problems, not forcing them to translate it into jargon that we're used to hearing and addressing in a substantive way these you know, historic inequities and recognizing, as Otta said, in the, in the case of education, it's not just education. Um, you know, the pandemic has shown us that communities that are vulnerable are vulnerable in just in a variety of areas across the board. And as a result, health, education, jobs, they were all crushed in those communities in ways that they weren't impacted in other communities. So when we're thinking about any change and change to address climate change, we've got to recognize that the investments that we're going to need to make in those communities in order for them to be positioned to benefit from in a fair and equitable way, the investments that are being made in order for their homes from the perspective of GWP, in order for their homes and, and multifamily homes often to be prepared for electrification, they're going to need to be significant infrastructure investment. Otherwise, it won't happen. So we've got to look at all the things that we have to do in a disproportionate way to bring those communities to a point that they are level and can benefit from all of the things that we will do. And we've got to do it intentionally. And you know, the devil's always in the details. <laughs> you know, there's the talk and I think where Los Angeles is stepping forward is in investing in the planning and the collaboration and the outreach and the connectivity to walk the talk. Wow, powerful and also relevant. And as you were talking, a lot of people were commenting about how relevant um, the intersectionality of all of this is and how the city will you know, move forward in coordinating and collaborating these intersectional issues. And I think that this panel is representation of, of those intersectional perspectives and our intersectional infrastructure and how we will work together to in invest in those priorities to ensure that 
all Angelinos are in on this. Capri, in a few words, how would you like to address those priorities? And, and then maybe we can move on to the next, the next question. Yes, I, I just want to be willing to echo the statements that um, pre um, President Cynthia McLean Hill mentioned. Um, I mean, definitely hearing from vo the voices of young, communi of young uh, community members, community members of color, just to understand exactly the work that is needed for climate justice. Um, and I think, you know, making sure that we have continued resources in this space. I know that Mayor Garcetti has laid the foundation even in this year's budget to help to make sure that we have more resources to be intentional to move the needle forward. And so I just wanted to echo the communities that have been hardest hit need to be heard the most in, in this space in this time to come out with real tangible solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Capri. And actually, that was my next question is like, what is our call to action? But you answered it before I asked it. So let's go to Auda. Auda, what is your call to action? I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I was hoping I didn't do it this time. Uh, my, my, you know, my call of action is very simple. As leaders, as community leaders, as uh, policy uh, makers as uh, folks that sit in boards and commissions and so forth is to always think about as we have this conversation, as we move the needle in climate, uh, environmental and climate conversations and how sustainable we can get and it, can we uh, transform homes and so forth. I always want to make sure that we bring everybody along. And so as my call to action is as we put policies together, as we create projects, as we create programs, as we create anything that will be serving our community, is that we think of everyone. And so one example that I always think about, in, and I heard it in, in you know, the multiple conversations that we have, is are we are we excluding folks as we move this conversation forward? Are we excluding our low income community? The way, I, and a perfect example is this, are we asking for us to have, and you know, we wanna make sure that we're uh, conscious about our climate and we're asking folks to move into a different type of car or truck or so forth. Do our folks have the means to buy that? And if not, can we bring, pro, uh, some kind of an incentive, a rebate, a, a something that we can do so that folks that do not have the financial means to move along with us as this conversation continues, that we help them bring them along. So my call to action is that, is really as, as leaders, you know, please always think about families, think about elders, think about folks that don't have the financial means to say, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna buy myself a new truck that has, you know, electrical and so forth. You know, a lot of us can't do it any, you know, even if we are not, you know, um, in that situation, that's hard to do. It's a priority. We have to make, change things around. Insurance gets, you know, higher. And so it just accumulates. So as, again, you know, my call to action is very simple. You know, as we build projects, as we build programs, let's just think of everyone and the impacts they will have on folks financially. Uh, you know, are they going to lose jobs? Are they going to lose contracts? Those are things that, that I would say worry me as we move along in the conversation. Great. Thank you, Aura. Um, let's see, Capri, did you have a call to action for folks? Yes. Uh, you know, it just to be really um, intentional to remind folks from uh, underserved communities that this is your issue. This is your future. This is your children's future. Uh, we cannot just rely on, you know, folks from the West Side to you know, be the advocates as it relates to um, our environment because this is the very air that we breathe. Um, and I call on my leaders, uh, especially the voices of color, to be at the forefront of this response. Um, I think it's really important to know that you know communities of color are the first to be impacted. So we understand this problem better than anyone and may have uh, vital solutions because like I said, we're dealing with this on a regular basis. We know that um, I, I, even as council president uh, Martinez said, you know, being an activist in this space was not something that was chosen. In some instances has been chosen for us. 
So as government, we need to be um, mindful and willing and receptive to some of these the ideas that are coming from the community um, because they're actually, you know, five ways, they're, they're five ways to do anything. And then and speaking of that number, I just wanted to say there are, you know, five ways to build greener neighborhoods without um, green gentrification, you know, transformative infrastructure, um, neighborhood transformation with the scattered sites approach, um, large master uh, plan infill development, infill development with housing and open space on site, infill development with housing and open space on different sites. These are just a few examples of, of what affected communities of color would be able to bring to the conversation. So that is why it's so important that they are included and that we as government are here to listen and to support and to undergird those things. I don't leave you with this. The old folks uh, told me that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So we want to be sure that um, we is, have as many people at, ta at the table as possible. Fantastic, fabulous. And with that, Cynthia, I'm going to go on to the questions, but you're going to be the first one to answer those questions. There was a question about energy justice and how do we bring energy justice to LA, but you can combine that with your call to action. <laughs> first, um, I'm really uh, pleased to say that LADWP has uh, been engaged with and done significant outreach with community-based organizations and continues to do so in connection with um, our LA 100 um, plan. Moving forward, I would like to just tell everyone to check ladwp.com slash LA 100 um, for upcoming community meetings and ways to connect with the work that we're doing because it is vitally important that we hear from you. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, your question was, oh, energy justice. Energy justice. In terms of how you get to energy justice, it's interesting that that question is being asked. We've been um, working uh, internally, looking at the INREL study and looking at ways of deepening what we've already done to be more specific, to focus more specifically on the equity plan as opposed to simply the energy transition plan. Um, and among the things that we're looking at and that, that have kind of the tenants that, that have emerged um, inside the department is first and foremost to acknowledge, um, to recognize and acknowledge historical um, and present basis for, for, in, for inequity. I mean, before you can get to energy justice, you've just got to get real about what we've done already and how badly we've done it so that we can identify where change needs to take place. Um, in addition to that, um, we need to look at the distribution of benefits and burdens and, and be clear and intentional about making sure that moving forward, it's equitable. And finally, um, looking at the ability of people to be involved in decision making. Those are the three critical um, components of getting to energy justice. So that's that would be my response to that question. Thank you, Cynthia. That's a really good segue for what I wanted to say that the, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, one of its um, mandates is to create creative, bold civic engagement through its commission, which will be represented by um, frontline communities, indigenous communities, youth, labor. So it's gonna be a really great cross-section of the city and um, experts as well. That'll help us create the, the equitable climate action roadmap. Um, but I wanted to get back to um, something else that you said about being equitable across the city. I have a question here saying, hey, you know, Everybody mentions South Los Angeles, East Los Angeles, but up here in the San Fernando Valley, there are many pockets and areas that also need representation. And I just want to say two things that the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office will address um, constituencies all across the city. But I also want to point out that uh, Vice President and Commissioner Aura Garcia is herself from the Valley. And I wanted to see if she had something to say about representation for the Valley. Mute. You're muted. Again, <laughs> I just have to say that I um 
I'm kind of from every, I grew up in, you know, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. I, I've lived here all my life and I can't see myself living anywhere else. And unless it's Hawaii in a really big house. <laughs> but, <laughs> but other than that, I love the city I grew up in. And so I was very blessed to, and I see it in a positive light. I was the kid that was a bus kid. So I grew up in the South LA, Pico Union area, and I was bused out to the Valley every day from middle school to high school, every single day, 5 a.m. in the morning. It was, you know, at that time we might be, you know, not happy with it, but I actually have to say that it gave me a broad perspective of the entire city. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why I love what I do now because I see the entire the entire city. But yeah, and as a grown up, I came to live to the Valley because obviously, you know, you, you migrate this way once you start going to school and so forth. And so I see also how sometimes a lot of our efforts, our conversations are around the more central area. And sometimes our Valley areas are, um, not not that they're overseen, not at all, because we have very strong leaders and very good council members that make sure that our valley is well represented. But you know, there's times that we just don't think that the valley is going through something like this. And so, like I said from the beginning, you know, working my time in the Northeast Valley for many years, we we had to educate our community on the disparities of the injustice of the environment. You know, we live around a, a, an airport. We, you know, that, that drives right through homes. I'm sure you guys have heard of this recently. We live uh, next to landfills. You know, I'm five minutes away from the Lopez Canyon, which is now very well taken care of and so forth. But back many years ago, it was not. And so there was a lot of uh, conversation that had to have. There was a lot of advocacy, like Cynthia said, that had to have had, to, that happened during that time. And so I just, I, you know, the valley also has its shares. You know, we also suffer high temperatures. You know, we, you know, it could be, it could easily get to 115 out in the valley when it's one of those hot days. I live in Selmar, so you know, you can imagine, you know, how hot it gets here. And so, th those are things that we also have to look at. We have, you know, we have been looking at that through the Bureau of uh, of Streets LA. They, they, they've thought of ways of, you know, creating a cooler asphalt, uh, very much needed here in the valley. Folks are walking kids are walking in on sidewalks that are very hot and and that's something else that we also also need to need to think about so I do and in the in short of all this you know the valley also has a lot of its shares of in environmental injust justices or injustices you know however you want to put it uh and not so long ago didn't we just have um uh, a gas leak in one of our, our you know, it was you know, just a, what, a couple oh, of canyon gas leak. Yeah, actually, we had a question about that. And I don't have an answer that when, when are we going to actually shut down Aliso Canyon? I think that's a multi jurisdictional response, but we will definitely get to, I will get to all of the questions after this conversation and I will respond to them. And uh, definitely, I was going to ask you that. I see there are a ton of questions related to DWP, and I'd be happy to answer them um, after we're done with like the broadcast. If I can get a list go ahead and answer, answer one of those questions, Cynthia, right now, if you'd like. <laughs> uh, God. I can also relay them to you after the conversation so that we can. Yeah, I, mean, I see quite a few. I mean, there's okay. that question about yeah, it's, it's um, low income um, uh, subsidies, and I can certainly you know respond to that. There are questions about. Um, you know, any number of questions here uh, regarding how we bill and things of that nature, it probably would make more sense to do it when we're done with this as opposed to going trying to tick through them. Um, but I will say that, uh, again, just because we have, you know, two incredibly large projects underway, both the um, both one related to power and one related to water, that we are actively engaged in continuous consultation. And in fact, one of the lenses through which we um, are looking at our 100% renewable plan design is through the Valley Generating Station and literally um, making sure that the actions that we take as it relates to, to move to a clean grid result in a de in decreased use of that specific, um, that specific plant and facility. 
Uh, you know, there has been years of tremendous advocacy. And in addition to that, we have both a mayor and a council that's incredibly sensitive to these issues, which is why we're all sitting in the chairs that we sit in. And I think it's important for people to understand that that kind of advocacy and that kind of focus makes a difference. Um, you know, five years ago, environmental justice would not have been on the table as it relates to designing clean grid. It would have been all about resiliency and all about, you know, all of the other things that are critically important. But when we sit down and look at what our plans and what our actions will be, environmental justice is one of the factors, is a factor that is equal to reliability and resiliency and cost and all of the other, um, you know, the other uh, very short list of things that the principles that guide our work. And that is a testament to the leadership of the city. And it's also a testament to those communities, to frontline communities who've made it clear that they want issues that affect them addressed. And they connect, you know, and they understand that the health of their children, that the air that their kids breathe, that, um, you know, that the condition of the community overall are affected by a hundred decisions that are made outside of their communities. And they're coming to each of us to change the way we do it. And Marta, the real a genius of your office is they can connect with you and you can serve as a hub for the rest of us. Um, because you know, housing, transportation, all of these sectors uh, have significant impact on both climate change and environmental justice. And I'm, I'm always loath to leave out the economic impacts because I just have to say over and over and over again, um, you know, both cost and employment benefit in, because people talk about the green economy and, and they know that anytime you make great sector shifts, there are going to be new industries and new jobs associated with that. And they wanna know that they will be trained for those jobs, that they'll have access to those jobs. That those jobs will be distributed in a way that is equitable, which means sometimes, you know, pushing those communities up front. Um, and, and that's the solution to other problems that we have in the city. So um, I'm, I'm excited about where we are and, you know, and just appreciate the opportunity to do this work. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, President McLean Hill. Those are great, powerful parting words for you. And now we have about 20 seconds for Capri and then Auda, and then we'll wrap. So let's hand it over to Capri. Yes, um, you know, I just I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity to you know have this forum, and I definitely want to be clear and intentional that LA Civil Rights is here to um, support you as you convene meetings with the community. Uh, you know, we can be found at Civil and Human Rights at LA City. Sorry. Uh, civil and human rights .lacity .org, and just know that we are a partner for equity and justice as it relates to it relates to a number of plate of things, but particularly environmental justice. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Uh, Aura. Yes. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that through the lens of the Board of Public Works, right now we we have we're very fortunate that we have a good a uh, group of commissioners sitting at the table that think about all of this in in a big in in a in a big lens so projects as we build projects as we're building programs as we continue to build the infrastructure of the city we're making sure as, as a general managers as a board of public works we're making sure that everything's equitable and it's at, at the forefront of everything that when we make decisions and that everything we do Awesome. And I just want to acknowledge all the great activity in the chat space. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your questions. This serves to inform all of us here on this panel and the city of Los Angeles. So although we didn't get to all the questions, I will and we will allocate the questions to the respective departments and uh, leadership that needs to see them. And um, I just want to say thank you to each of you for making the time for this really important discussion on this really um, transformative day that is the beginning, just the beginning as um, General Manager Capri Maddox said for, for justice in terms of, of you know, what ha what's happening ar across the nation uh, to black and brown communities with excessive force 
and police departments. It's, it's just the very beginning. And um, we need to create a healing of our planet and our health. We must imagine like this new future and a world where we are healthy, respected and embrace our role as caretakers of our health and of our and of nature and have bold and brave systems of change and action and advocacy that can lead us to decarbonize, detoxify and democratize. And what I've taken away from my speakers, our speakers today, um, is that we do have time to act. We do have time to mitigate and reverse the harm and address the health disparities and the inequalities that we face during the pandemic and post-pandemic. And we can do it in alignment. We can do it simultaneously. We can do it synergistically. It doesn't have to be pandemic versus climate. It can be a very strategic collaborative process as we see these investments come in from the federal government. And I'm excited to be working with all of you and all of the constituents that chimed in today. And thank you so very much for your participation. And again, this is just the first and we'll have more conversations and uh, thank you again so much. Mm -hmm.